Welcome to another episode of The Time Is Now, where the Word of God is truth and power. My name is Pastor Charles White of the Ecclesia of Jesus Christ, 7475 Fallbrook Avenue, West Hills, California. Evangelist Pastor Sean McDermott. Evangelist Bruce Williams. A minister <coughs> named Matthew Iricus. <laughs> Thanks. Today we're going to be talking about, it's going to turn out to be a very controversial topic. And we're going to talk about the Bible versus the church. And people are going to say, well, what do you mean by the Bible versus the church? The Bible is the word of God and God history of his people from beginning to end. But the church is something that Jesus built exclusively. And so much of the church is following not what Jesus built. They're following what they have conjured up in their own mind according to the Bible. And so we could be talking about that, and I want to start out in Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to start with verse number 12. <clears throat> and make, we could probably make so many people mad tonight, but it doesn't matter because people need to hear what truth is. Verse 12 says this, Giving thanks to the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, and whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Let's just stop there real quick and say this. He's delivered us from the power of darkness, and he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. The church don't even know that they've been, well, Christians don't know that they've been forgiven of their sins. And they continue to keep talking about sins. And number one, he says, in the blood of Jesus, we have redemption in his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominion, principalities, or powers, all things was created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. Now, if he's the head of the body, the church, he didn't say he's the head of the Bible. He's the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So when you start to understand the difference between the church and the Bible, Jesus won't preeminence. He didn't say give the Bible preeminence. He said give him preeminence. Now, watch what it says here. It says, verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, in him. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked work, now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Now, you try to tell that to a Christian nowadays. Uh, did you sin? Did you cuss? Did you chew? Did you drink? He says he has presented you holy, unblameable. So they need to understand what the word unblameable means. That means there's no reason to blame. You can't be blamed of anything. If you continue in the faith, ground it and settle and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. If you stay believing and faithing in what Jesus Christ did in the hope of the gospel, he said, you are unblameable in his sight. What you have heard of which preach every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister, who now rejoicing in my sufferings for you and filled up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now listen to what he says. The church has been hidden in a mystery from the beginning. So the Bible been around a long time. So he says the church is a hidden mystery that is now being manifested now to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentile, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what makes the church out is that God is going to put his spirit inside of you, which they didn't have in the old covenant. The spirit came on them and left off them. Right. But this is the time where God is going to put his spirit inside of his people and that's what forms the church. And when he put his spirit inside of you, we could talk about that a little bit later because other people got things that they want to say right now. But he put his spirit inside of you that has never been known 
since the beginning of ages that Jesus was going to die, raised from the grave, and the Bible said he was a quickening or life-giving spirit, which means now he can take the Spirit of God and put it inside each and every one of us, and that's what makes us the body of Christ or his body and become one with him in the Father. It's kind of, kind of what, you, what, what you went through right there is think about it like this. Well, Jesus says it all the time in the Bible is, is this. You, you come to the Bible, you search the Scriptures to find life, but you won't come to me. Yeah. So that's the purpose. Is, oh, I took your stuff, man. No, no. no, it's, no I'll say this real Go quick. With I, it, man. I thought it was funny because yeah. I had that verse, but after you started talking, I started like moving somewhere else, and I'm like, It'll come up before he starts talking. <laughs> go ahead, brother. Man. I want Matt to go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, man. you're good. No, you know, I'm going to you. Know, go ahead, go ahead. Your... Finish your pass. You got it, you got it, you got it. You got it. We'll start okay, we got to go to John to hear what Jesus said in John. That's what Matt was saying. He wanted to talk about it, but Sorry, I had man. it earlier, too. No, I, I'm, I'm happy you did because I was moving off of it. John 5, verse number 39. <laughs> Jesus says this, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, he's making this as plain as he can make it. You can search the scriptures all day long, mm -hmm. and he says, you think you have life because you're searching scriptures. Yeah. He said, but, and they, all the scriptures are as testifying of, of me. me. And this is why I say to everybody when I talk to people, I don't care if you read in Genesis, wherever you go in the Bible, you should be able to see Jesus in every <clears throat> story that you read. And then he says, and will not come to me that they might have life. So Jesus is telling you there's a difference between the scriptures and him. And the best way to see that is this. Did not Pharisees know the scriptures? Yeah. Yep. Did not the Pharisees think they were righteous because they were keeping the scriptures? The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they were all boasting in the law yep. or in the scriptures. Then the rich young ruler comes up and he says, <laughs> I've kept all these laws since my youth. <clears throat> okay. Jesus didn't tell him he was going into the kingdom. Then we read about Paul. Paul says, man, when it came to the law, and I was blameless right. when it came to those things, but Jesus had to blind him on the road to Damascus and say, listen, uh, you're kicking against the pricks. Who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. So there's a difference between the church and just reading mm -hmm. scriptures Amen. and trying to pull scriptures to justify your life or what you want to do in life. Then he says this. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and not seek the honor that comes from God only? Mm. Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. That's another scenario you can t tell where the church is so much not understanding the truth. Right. Remember when they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus? And what did they say? The law no. of Moses says she should be stoned to death. What do you say? That shows you that's a difference between the scriptures and Jesus. And she, they said, Moses said, stone. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, he without sin, you cast the first stone. Then he asked the woman, where are your accusers? I have none. No man has condemned you? No, neither do I condemn you. That's just fulfill what he said right here. Moses will accuse you to the Father, not me. If you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So why do people think that it's about keeping these laws when he said Moses was only writing of me? And the, relate, the key to the church is having a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, all right. So uh, we've talked about this once a while back. I'm not sure if it's on a podcast that was posted yet or not, but um, basically how the false church, you got to be careful of these ministers of light, the Satan's ministers of light, who's, it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15, their end is according to their works. So instantly, see, now this is where you've got to be careful because, right, you, you come up against someone who's like a Pharisee, who they can quote scriptures to you, and maybe in your mind, instantly you start to back down going, oh God, these people really know what they're talking about. Don't just give those people credence to assume that they know what they're talking about. They may have no idea what they're talking about. You need to understand or see if they actually know who Christ is, which in John 17, 3 is eternal life. And that leads me to say that I would say maybe most of the church recognizes Christ Jesus as their Savior. Cool? Step one. Step two, 
Let's drop off 80% of the church at this point. Step two is knowing Christ as their Lord. Uh, that means doing yeah. what God said. You know, this is what Romans talks about. This is where it says, like, you no longer live to yourself, 2 Corinthians 15. You live for Christ. You've, you're supposed to die to yourself. And unless you've died to yourself, which means you serve Christ. So if he says go somewhere, you drop everything and go immediately. Or else, first of all, you're God before him, which he said, don't put any gods before me. But second of all, do, do you actually love him? He's not your Lord if you don't do what he says. So, I mean, we'll go into that maybe another time, what he tells the church to do, right? Well, but um, but I, before I go into, or maybe we'll go into that later, what he tells us to do as, as if, we're, if he's our Lord, I should say. But the third thing that people miss, so we have Savior, we have Lord, and the third one, I, I'm going to dwindle it down to one-tenth of the church maybe understands this part. Christ is the sacrifice, the accepted sacrifice. And so most people don't understand Christ as the accepted sacrifice because if you understood the sacrifice, now it's no longer about works. So when we go into the Old Testament, we're supposed to read the law came to bring death. The sacrifice was brought to bring back life. Right. And ultimately, no sacrifice but the blood of God could do that. So you need to understand what the sacrifice means. And I'll just sum it up real quick and easy by saying the sacrifice gives you eternal life because it makes atonement for your soul because it was the precious blood of Christ, which was good enough to cover you. And more than that, to bury you new life in a new covenant, which was sanctified by his blood. Now, I say all this to say, I want to move into Romans real quick. Uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Now, this is where the church, missing all three of those components, will come to, and they don't even realize they're doing it. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. By not glorifying him as God, you would deny one of those three, if not all of them. So you denied him as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, but became fools. So these are the people that like are pompous about knowing so much word, you don't know anything. Because if you knew Christ again as the sacrifice, you're not going to be pompous about anything. He did the work. He was the worthy lamb. Keep reading. Now this is where I'm going. Verse 23. And they changed the image of the uh, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, into birds, into four footed beasts and creeping things. Why do I bring that verse up? Well, you go to Deuteronomy five, six through nine, and it tells you don't make graven images, don't make any God and put it before me, don't make them out of wood or stone. What's the Bible? Isn't the Bible paper? It's made out of wood and started with scrolls, moved to codex. It's all papyrus. It moves into that whole category of wood. People have made the Bible of God and put, I've heard people say this, that the Bible is the word of God. Now you've just taken a corruptible yeah. thing yeah. and put it at the same level as Christ Jesus. And you have just brought him down to a four footed beast creeping thing, wood, hay, stubble. You've brought Christ down to absolutely nothing. And uh, I guess I'm going a lot longer than I expected to, but I want to say that to say this. If you bring <laughs> it to this word and you bring it to this book as being the word of God, you now no longer give Christ the glory because you've taken away from the sacrifice and again made it about the law. You missed the point of the law by doing so. Ephesians 1 verse 6, what is this all about? To the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us, going back to Ezekiel, he has done all these things to sanctify us, accepted in, in the beloved. So in Christ, when we die to ourselves, we are accepted in the body of Christ because the body of Christ was sacrificed for us all. Um, you can keep going. I'm going to move up to verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. The glory of his grace is meant that by his grace, we are saved, and by being saved, we testify that his blood was good enough. All of this comes back to knowing Christ as the Lord, Savior, and the sacrifice to his glory, to the praise of what Christ has done. And see, I'm glad you said all of that because, <laughs> <laughs> because it needs to be said. It's good. And so many people don't understand that. And like you said a minute ago, uh, if you're really in the body of Christ, you have died to yourself. And you have become his. That's why he said you're bought with a price and you're not your own anymore. You cannot, if you don't understand that, the only way you can understand that is to understand then that he is your Lord. Because yeah. if he's your Lord, he said, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say. So many people are not doing anything that Jesus said, but they're <laughs> living their life. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But it's because of a misunderstanding, something you just said when they bring God down to the level of four-footed beast and creeping things. And when God says the cardinal mind is enmity against him, 
Now, I want to show you when he first built a church how most people are so caught in the mind that they can't see it. Matthew 16. <coughs> when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciple, who do men say that the I, the son of man, am? They said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Right there, you brought him down to a corner level and trying to compare him to one of the prophets. And Jesus is not a prophet. Jesus is the son of God, the son of the living God that came down and he said God prepared a body for him. Right. So in that body, he was the son of mm -hmm. God, but in an earthly body. And he said to them, but whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father, which is in this heaven, which is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter and up on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the whole church started telling itself, you got to be built on Peter. Yeah. That's because we brought it down to a carnal mindset. If you read this scripture correctly, he's not building the church on Peter. He tells Peter that he has a revelation which he couldn't have gotten nowhere other than from God. Uh, yeah. And he says, upon this rock, I am going to build my church. What church? On what rock? The, the revelation, revelation coming from God to man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that revelation come to God to man? Jesus first has to die. Right. And when he raised from the grave, he become a life-giving yes, spirit. spirit. And when he puts the spirit inside of us, now we have a connection back to, fa to the Father yeah. where now God can give a revelation through the spirit to come into your heart. And that revelation would allow you to be able to understand that is truth that he's speaking. Right. That revelation would open up things in the Bible that God wants you to see to reveal things to you. But the church is supposed to be built on the revelation. Right. And this is why on the day of the Pente Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit fell on everybody is what is the beginning of the church age. Now watch what he says after this. He said, I say to you that you're, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, most people take that scripture and start saying, Satan, you have no power against me. And they start using it from a defensive mode. God wants you to use it from an offensive mode. When he said they can't prevail against you, that means the gates of hell can't stop you. Can't stop you from doing what? Preaching the gospel. That's right. Can't stop you from going back into the places of darkness and bringing those people out, the lost sheep out that belong to God. The kingdom of heaven can't stop you now. But when you go and see a demon and cast a demon out, it can't stop you from doing those things. But the church has put it around them as a hedge to protect what well, Christians have put it around them. I am protected. I am protected. He didn't give you the spirit to say you're protected. He gave you the spirit to say you have dominion and you can walk into Satan's kingdom. The strong man has been bound. And whenever the spirit of God walks in there, the strong man is bound. You can go back and take all those souls. Because what was Jesus' mission? I come for that which was lost, the whole oh, house of Israel. I'm going to make you fishers of men to go out and fish these lost souls back that belong to God. That's what the mission is from Adam and Eve. Man got lost to God, and now man has to be fished back in, and that's why he gave us the spirit and the power of the churches to go back into these places of darkness. What did the church tell you? What do Christians tell you? Stay Don't out go into no dark places. Darkness. You shouldn't be caught in darkness. That's where you're supposed, <laughs> you're supposed to, to go. Be. You're supposed to go into the dark. What did the Bible say about Jesus? The light the came into where? Dark. Darkness. darkness. Now, let me ask you this question. If the light came into darkness, that means every place here is darkness. Right. There is no light here other than what God put in here to be light. Amen. So when he put his spirit inside of you, you're light in darkness, and you can see your way through the darkness to pull back the souls that God wants. Then he says this, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Most Christians don't even know anything about having the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He says, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Have you ever heard people try and use this, oh, I'm going to loose that, and I'm going to bind that to me. And they try and use it with this cardinal mindset yeah. for cardinal things and cardinal blessings, and they have no idea what that scripture means, but all you got to do is turn your Bible to John 20, and you'll find out what it means. That's right. Let's go to John 20. Right. <laughs> he said, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't have to open up my theological textbook to figure yeah, this out. You ain't got to do none of that to What figure about this a commentary? Out. What yeah. about a commentary? Those, those are great. Yeah, and this is the whole <laughs> proof of it. What's the spirit? Jesus raises from the dead, verse 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples assembled for fear of the Jews, then came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, Peace be to you. And when he had said so, 
He showed them his hands, his side. Then was the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus answered, and Jesus said to them, Peace be to you. My father has sent me, even so have I sent you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what starts the church age where the revelation comes from God. Now watch what he says. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. <clears throat> that goes back to what he said. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose. So what is he telling you? Once you give the gospel to people and they receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and they believe Jesus and accept him as their Lord, Savior, and uh, the, the yeah, ultimate sacrifice, okay. you're supposed to tell them your sins have been remitted Amen. completely. But the church don't do that or Christians don't do that. Well, your sins of the past have been remitted, but you can't sin no more. That is not what he said. Your sins have been remitted, past, present, or future. And the reason they don't understand that goes back to what Matt said. They don't even understand the sacrifice. When you did the sacrifice at the East Gate in the Old Covenant, it wasn't for a year backwards. It was for a year forward. forward. So it, it covered your sins in the future and the ones behind you. So when Jesus died and covered sin, when you accept him, all your sins from the past was covered and all your sins for the future. forward is covered. And so they don't even understand the <clears throat> sacrifice. So most Christians don't even understand that Jesus came to take away sin. Yeah. And I'm going to say that because Matt looked like he's about to jump out of the seat so we would let him come out of there. Look, but when you read Jesus, what they said, hold it in. at the very beginning, <laughs> at the very beginning, when Jesus saw the man with palsy and they brought him the man with palsy, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And everybody looked at Jesus and said, who is this that he can forgive sin? It said, Jesus perceived their thoughts and Jesus said this, that you may know you may that know. the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive <laughs> sins. Pick up your bed and walk. And when he picked up the bed and walked, that was a sign that his sins had been forgiven. Amen. Amen. And people get caught up in miracles nowadays. Oh, what a miracle for healing. What a miracle for... The miracle is to show you that your sins have been forgiven. The miracle Amen. is not to show off that he you can heal somebody. This person can raise from the dead. The miracle is... Listen, the Bible says the signs follow, follow the, word. the word. When you give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you can let them know, listen, your sins, <clears throat> Jesus was the final sacrifice. Your sins have been given, forgiven past, present, mm -hmm. and future your slate is clean. Yeah, so uh, so I don't know why I, my head just went over here, and I don't typically reference things like this, but um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Narnia, right? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So at, the, I came to this because I started thinking about a king. Most people, I, I hate to say it, but they don't understand what a king was. Back in the day, the king would be the... Why do you think we call the president the commander-in-chief? The king was a war hero, typically, in a lot of warring city-states. Yeah. And then it would follow the lineage, right? So um, when you were talking about the gate, we're going into the gate. We, we need to understand ourselves. If we're supposed to be kings and priests in the next lives, not only do we serve the gospel, which is the priest, which means we serve the blood, which is really what, where I want to go with that, right? So uh, keep that in mind. A priest serves the blood. The king serves the judgment and the law. The thing about being a soldier as a king means you protect the doctrine, but you go into the land, which when we talk about the gate, you're so why do you think it says a gate? In the Hebrew Old Testament, a gate was a picture of a head, a picture of a door, and a picture of water. And it, well, the picture of water was kind of an additive, like a child root, but the head swivels back and forth, and the door was the idea of something that swung back and forth um, from the head swivel, right? So altogether, they come out to mean gate, <coughs> and water is something fluid. So it's something that moves fluidly in and out. You're supposed to come into this world like Christ did as a king and a soldier, go in through the gate, open the door, and then bring back people through the door. There's yeah. only one door, yeah. and it's Christ, right? So you're supposed to be that king. But I say that to say, you're a soldier in Christ's army. That's what you were bought for. And... The reason I brought up Narnia is because I want to bring you back to the end of the movie where the kings are victorious, right? The Peter, right? The king was on the battlefield and he fought. But at the end, when all of the allies were laying on the ground dead, you see that little girl, Lucy, 
I can't believe I remember all these names. I haven't seen this movie in years. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I sure. haven't, seen, well, I haven't then, seen it at all. You know, alert. <laughs> so, but I say this to say. Watched it last night. There's a, bu- <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of dead allies on the ground. And um, this, <laughs> this guy gives her this vial a long time ago in the center of the movie or whatever. And it heals all sicknesses, right? So you see a bunch of these people like lying down on the battlefield. And this basically, this vial is like the blood. So you're supposed to go and take the blood and sprinkle it into the mouth of the thing, and it brings it back to life, basically, the, the dead soldiers. We're supposed to be dead. We're dead on the ground. So can you imagine this girl has this magic potion of healing, whatever, we'll call it blood, and at the end of the battle, when they're all down, you go and you drip it in everyone's mouth who died, and you all, you know, you all live. You're all back to life. Can you just imagine her going to this like dead or dying soldier and going, you need to keep the law. You can't do this, this, and this, okay? Okay, and they're just like, they're dead. Yeah. What the hell do they care? They're dead. They were brought back to life by that blood. And so it's the same thing for us. If you go into this world, into the darkness, and go, stop being dark. You got to stop being dark. That's how you, that's how you do it. How can, how can not light create light? You can't. You have to give them the blood that gave them the life or the light. So... You just see a bunch of Christians having no idea that they're soldiers. You, they have no idea that they're supposed to be spreading life and not death because by the law came death. It came the condemnation. And Christ, co- he commissioned you to do what? Spread the gospel. The gospel is to bring life to these people, not the law. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to go with that. You, you're not a soldier for Christ, which is what he bought and commissioned you for if you're going around preaching the law on people, on dead people, nevertheless. Well, I said this last night when I was ministering. If you don't recognize what God said at the very beginning, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. So the moment that Adam and Eve ate of that tree and everybody born after that was born into death. Death. See, the cardinal mind, that's why I keep saying, the cardinal mind makes you think you're alive. Mm-hmm. And, but they don't understand that death means perdition, which is a total, mm-hmm. complete separation from God. So once Adam and Eve fell, that was a total, complete separation from God. And this is why in the garden, God killed the first animal, covered Adam and Eve with the skins for the blood is what makes an atonement for the soul. So he didn't have to kill them. And this is why they had Abraham bosoms where everybody had to go and stay rested there and wait for the final sacrifice to be paid. And so when you understand that, the law had to come. The Bible said the law came to make the whole world guilty. And Paul said, the law that was supposed to give life killed me. The law came and I died. What is Paul saying? Even those ones who thought they were alive, who fell into the deception that they're not dead, that they're alive, the law had to come to make you realize you're dead too. Yep. So now when you realize you're dead, the only thing that can help you is Jesus. No law can help you. No priest can help you. The only thing that can help you is the price of sin. Right. The wages of sin or the yeah. price of sin is death. Somebody who's worthy enough had to come and pay the price because you're not a sin, a sinner because you sin. Mm-hmm. You're a sinner because you were born a sinner. And that's what the church don't seem to realize. You were born a sinner, and by not sinning, don't get you out of being born a sinner. You're still a sinner unless yep. you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and his blood cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Now, this is why I want to say this, and then I know Sean been shaking his head. He got something to say, too. But... uh. <laughs> I'm just enjoying you guys are on fire. <laughs> Matthew 7, and Matthew 7 <laughs> says this to let you know that the, there's a different a separation between the church and the Bible. Right. Now, watch what it says in Matthew chapter 7. He says in verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, stop right there. Is an atheist going to be calling him Lord? Nope. nope. Is a Muslim going to be calling him Lord? Nope. Is a Buddhist going to be calling him Lord? Nope. So who's the only people that's going to call Jesus Lord? It's people Christ. in the church. Somebody in the body of Christ is going to be calling him Lord. He says, he said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter to the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So it ain't about calling him Lord. It ain't about quoting scriptures. It's about who's going to do his will. Mm-hmm. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesy a priest in your name Uh-oh. and in your name we'll cast out devils and in your name there are many wonderful works and then I will profess to them I never knew you depart from me you that work iniquity mm-hmm. this 
Scary. Has to let people understand. He says, you got to talk about all the works. What did the church tell you? Oh, you got to do the works. Oh, well, we love James. James said, without mm -hmm. works, without faith, faith is dead. Yeah. And he said, he said, you could be confessing many wonderful works. You could be confessing, I cast out devils. Devils is not what gets you to heaven. Yeah. I told you, when you cast out a devil, that's the sign that Jesus had put his spirit in you and right. gave you dominion where you can go into Satan's kingdom and he cannot stop you from bringing souls back to God. Casting out devils is not for you to show the world that you got power to cast out devils. Mm -mm. Casting the devils is not for your benefit. It's for saving God's souls. Amen. So when these people come out and say, Lord, Lord, and don't do what he says, he cannot be your Lord if you're not doing what he told you to do. So he said, many people are going to say, Lord, Lord. And remember what he said. That, that street to righteousness is straight and narrow, and very few there be that find it. He said, but that path to unrighteousness is broad and wide, and many there be that go through it. So you have to understand Everybody that walk around saying I'm a Christian is not a Christian. Well, they're not of the body of Christ. Yeah. You could be a Christian. That's why I keep saying a Christian is a religion. The body of Christ is a coming together of one with God. And that's two different things. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that yet. Is it, is, it, is it also, too, the biggest problem that people have is they just, when they look at the Bible, they only look at the carnal part of it and not understanding that he's trying to get you to see spiritually. And if you don't yeah. never want to see spiritually, then you're going to always look carnal. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the biggest problems I've had when you deal with people. When they tell you, they'll say, they'll sing the songs, Jesus is my king, Jesus is my Lord. And then he says, if I'm your Lord, if I forgave you, you have to forgive. If you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. And then you're still a Christian holding unforgiveness in your heart. Mm -hmm. He says, do not judge because as you judge, so shall you be judged. He said, if you don't judge, you're not going to be judged. But Christians spend all their time doing what? Judging mm -hmm. others. He said, don't condemn because as you condemn, you will condemn, be condemned. They spend their time telling people, oh, you ain't God's. You're going to hell because you drink and you smoke and you've got tattoo. And they love condemning people. And the Bible tells you to be as your father who is merciful. Right. God could have condemned all of us because we all deserve to go to heaven. But he says, before Jacob or Esau came out of the womb, that's the thing that Christians miss, not right. the body of Christ, Christians missed it. Before they did any good or evil, God chose Jacob over Esau and said, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And he tells us that he chose us before the foundation of the world in Ephesians predestined to be holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. We don't even understand that when he chose us, he knew who he was choosing. Right. He knew who he was choosing to do his will. Now, here comes the part. Any man that comes to me, he must love less his mother, his father, his sister, his brothers, his children, yea, his own life, or he can't be my disciple. Matt said that earlier. When that happens, 80% of the people drop off right. because God's will is not important enough to them over what they want to do. Very, and I've been saying this since I got in church. There's very few Davids that God can call, very few Abrahams that God can call mm -hmm. because most people will not give God preeminence. They're going to let their wife have preeminence, their kids have preeminence, their job have preeminence. They give everything what gives them pleasure preeminence. They could give everything preeminence over God. Right. And as a man, true man of God, all these other things don't matter. Now, you might have to have a mindset to say, okay, I'm just speaking for myself. I can't speak for nobody else. I ain't a person on this planet worth me going to hell over. Right. I ain't a person on this planet worth me not doing the will of God. And if I have to let everything go to do the will of God, I will let everything go to do the will of God. Right. And I don't want to speak that, oh, man, you spoke that in my head. Listen, God is the only thing that matters. Right. It don't mean you don't love people. It don't mean you don't. These people have no understanding what fight they're in, what battle that they're in. You go down the wrong path, it's eternal. Right. That means there's no coming back from it. 
Once you get there, that's where you're at, either heaven or hell. Once you take your last breath, if you're on the wrong path, you could be one of these people talking, oh, Lord, Lord, I did all these things in your name. Yep. That ain't going to mean nothing at that point in time. Don't you have to make up your mind while you got breath in you what and how much God means to you. And it's very few people willing to take that track, I'm telling you. Right. Because it's a, it's a hell of a track. And I said that on purpose for people to say, oh, he said hell, yeah. <laughs> Some people go go to hell. Yeah. You know. So I'm saying this to say that Jesus making this thing plain to us, he said, when he, he gave us the parable of the wedding feast, he said, the feast is ready. Go bid them to come to the feast. He said, they start making excuses. One said, I got married and have a wife. I can't come. The other one said, oh, I just bought me some oxen, and I need to go take care of them, and I can't come. The other one, I need to go bury my father. They had all these excuses that they made right. not to do what it is that God wants them to do. And then when the time came, he said, close the door. I don't want none of them at my feast. Right. Go into the highways and byways and find and fill my house with anybody who will honor me enough and want to come to my wedding feast. And then they went and did that. He said, still full. I mean, still empty. Yes, we need some more room. He said, now go back in highways and bring the, the lame, mm -hmm. the maimed, the crippled. That's the place where we're at right now. And that's when Sean came in. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> we're at the place where God says, man, whoever you can find, they can be tattooed up. They can be drugs, whatever. Bring them into God and let God clean them up. Right. Bring these people into God's house. Go into the darkness and pull these people out of the places of darkness. Don't run from the darkness. When you run from the darkness, then you don't think that God has the power to watch over you through the darkness. And so the church is afraid of darkness when they're supposed to go into the darkness. Right. You know, you know, it's, it's funny, just talking, talking about personal experience right now. Before, before, I, before I came to Ecclesia, my brother had got killed. And I had to go to I had to go through this whole trial thing and the whole nine. And it's like I was real, real angry, real pissed off. You know, I wanted to I wanted to kill some people myself. You know, it was just that crazy. But then, because you're thinking cornerly, you're not thinking spiritual at the time. Yeah. But then after I, after I got filled with the spirit, and years has passed by, and now all of a sudden, it then made his <laughs> made his way back around where the guy that shot my brother. Now they passed a law where saying that they can reduce people's sentences. So he's trying to get his sentence reduced. And my sister calling me like, hey, it's not right. Da, 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 da. And it's crazy to me because I don't, it's hard to say, I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like, that's not gonna bring my brother back. And at the yeah. end of the day, I hope you, I hope you get Jesus. My thing is, hey, yeah. do you have Jesus while you was in there, man? Did you get to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I think people have to really truly understand that because we so corner sometimes that we don't get to see the spiritual side. And for me, not being filled with the spirit and the way that I was thinking and the way that I wanted to be. Hey, you think about it. You killed my brother, homie. We finna, it's, 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 it's about to go down. Duh, I'm, I'm going to do this in the courthouse. I'm not, I'm not caring. But now it's like you fast forward, and now it's like, I just hope I really you don't really care, but then at the same time, you know, it, it means so much to them, to your sister and them. Yeah. It's like, okay, you have to go and speak, but it really doesn't mean much anymore. It's like yeah. he's gone, and... I, for, hey, for, hey, hopefully he's there. Hopefully he's there. He's there. You know, I don't know for sure. I, I've never asked God. I, I've never asked God because that's between him and God. Yeah. But like I said, <coughs> bringing that thing back around, now it's like I don't feel the same resentment. <coughs> I don't feel that because I'm not going to harbor that because we all make mistakes. Well, absolutely. And that's the whole thing. If Jesus died to forgive sins. Forgive, man. You know? that's and it. it's just, I don't know. I, because I just, we're all wicked, man. Forgive yeah. it. And if God forgave us, and I, I said it last night in church about the parable of the debt to this dude owed a debt to the king. And, right. the, and the king said, I'm going to put you and your whole family in jail till you pay my debt. And he begged the king not to. And the king said, OK, I'm, I'm going to forgive you of all debt and let him get away with all debt. And so he left immediately. And he went out and grabbed somebody by the throat and said, you owe me money. Give me my money and cast him into prison. Mm -hmm. And then when the king found out about it, he said to him, I forgave you your debt. Shouldn't you have went out and found him and forgave him of his debt? Yeah. 
And he said, because you didn't do that, he said, I'm not going to forgive your debt. And he took him and put him in prison. Mm -hmm. And he said, that is the same way the kingdom of heaven operates. So there are so many people out here don't understand. That's why I said a minute ago, God, they think that, oh, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't chew, I don't do this. And that's what makes me get into the kingdom. Now, what makes you get into the kingdom is God has forgiven you of your debt. Right. And if he forgave you of your debt, you should forgive anybody who has trespassed against you of their debt. Right. And, and nobody wants to do that, but they say we're Christians and you're not if you don't do what, well, you're not of the body of Christ because if you're the body of Christ, you're going to do that. But I want to say this. Don't let the world fool you or Satan fool you that they don't know what the church is. And the reason I'm saying that, because I want to read you the definition that in the Black's Book of Law, the Black Book of Law, what the definition is in the Black's Law Dictionary, which is every courtroom in the United States knows what it is. Right. And this is what the definition is of a church. It ain't what you read in these Western Dictionary, <laughs> a congregation of people with religious beliefs. Uh, con you know, that is not what the definition of, that's why you go to court, court anywhere, but that definition don't mean anything. But if you go to the court, this is the definition of church. Defines church as follows. In its most general sense, the religious society founded and established by Jesus Christ to receive, which means to take into possession and control, preserve, which means to keep safe from harm, destruction, or decay, and propagate, cause it to spread his doctrine and ordinances. Now, think about what he just said. We're supposed to take what Jesus said, what he built the church on. We're supposed to protect it, preserve it, and spread, spread it. it. Now, tell me the church is doing that. Mm -mm. You tell me the church is preserving what Jesus said. And that's why I say again, I'm going to say here on this line, the message God gave me from the start when he called me into the ministry was Matthew 17, 10, restore all things to restore God's things. Because we've gotten so far away from what God said and what Jesus said, and we've been built on the traditions of what they say the church is, yeah. not on what God built the church to be. Right. We're no different than in the Old Testament when God told you what the temple was for, and then Jesus come on the scene, and there's no animal sacrifices going on. Right. There's no smoke descending from the temple. All the things that's supposed to be going on in the temple, they go, Jesus walks in there, and they're merchandising everybody. They're selling and and making money changes all through the temple. And Jesus had to go in and overthrow the temple. So you made it a den of thieves and it should have been a house of prayer. The church has become the same way. It become a den of thieves and not the house of prayer. Right. So that has to be restored. The only good thing about this new den of thieves is the coffee shops that they brought to the church. Now that <laughs> we can integrate. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> I just want to say, Bruce, uh, I've known you a long time and I've, I've never heard that before. So thanks for sharing. Oh, uh, my um, brother. Yeah, that's a cool uh, story, uh, man, because uh, it puts it in real time and where people can actually apply it. Because, Matt, you said something, you know, you guys have all said a lot, and I'm just taking it in and enjoying it, is, you know, we're submissive to the king. You know, we can. everyone wants him to be the savior, but as far as being king, then we have to be submissive to that audible <coughs> voice. And, you know, if the spirit says, go talk to this person, and you go, well, I don't, I don't, Look at them and look the way they act and look the way they dress and talk and what they're doing. I mean, the Spirit's telling you to forgive. It tells us all to forgive. But, you know, we can go, and especially in the Old Covenant, where you're like, you know, a murderer says he's put to death, you know, and they'll just find something out of context. And that's the biggest problem I have when people start sending scriptures of the day or, uh, you know, hey, Sean, can you give me a scripture for this? And No, I can give you Jesus. I can yeah. give you Jesus, I can 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 give you Jesus. Now, can you study the, the word to know the promises of God so that you can stand on them? Sure. But at the end of the day, being submissive to that audible voice, because Matthew seven twenty one used to really scare me, but it doesn't scare me anymore because, Lord, we've, yeah. we've done all these wonderful works in your name. We is just the plural I, because can a dead man do anything for a man who lives? And the answer is no. And if we can only do things because we're connected to Christ, then what do we have to boast in? Right. And you, if you cast out a demon and you don't get the person filled with the Holy Spirit, you've actually done them worse. And there was nothing in there about love. There was nothing in there about forgiveness. There was nothing in there about, Lord, we've taken the gospel you've given us. 
and we've given it to as many people as the <coughs> Spirit has led us because we love you. And 1 Corinthians 13, is we read it all the time. You hear it at weddings. You hear it all the time. Love, 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 love. But 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. So if you don't have God, you have nothing. And if you say he's God and he's not leading you, then he's not your God. And the world's message is hold on to your life. In fact, yeah. make this your home. Have your best life now. And God's message is die. Die to yourself. Because it, what is it? Colossians 2 is talking about, listen, all this vain philosophy of man's traditions and, and will worship or King James, New King James says self-imposed religion. You still worship yourself if you think that you can do something. You haven't come to the place where you're like, I'm dead. I, I, I'm only alive in Christ. And whatever he says to do, I'll do because his love is in me, and that's what f flows forth. And uh, <laughs> go ahead, Pastor. Listen, you know, I, I've I've heard I've heard this said, and and I agree with it to a certain extent. And that is, I hear people say, "Stand on the promises of God." What is the promise of God? Christ within you. Right now, so. Let's take that Christ in you. If when Christ is in you, Jesus said we become one with God. Right. What, that's the only promise you need to stand on. That's right. You oh. stand on that promise. Watch this. Let's go to Ephesians. Man, I'll never leave you. Ephesians chapter 1. This is after he said that he chose us before the foundation of the world and predestined us to be adopted by Jesus Christ. And we have forgiveness through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. But then he says something very profound in verse 11 on. In whom also we attain an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who trust, first trusted in Christ, and whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom we also, after to be, we believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Right. Uh -oh. The Holy Spirit was the promise. Yep. Uh oh. He said, which is the earnest or the deposit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Once he put his spirit inside of you, you are sealed to the day you die and he redeemed you back to himself. Yeah. That means, well, now let's go back to say what the promise is. What did Jesus say? All things that are of mine, mm -hmm. the Father gave me, I have given to you. We don't have to wait for anything. We have everything. It's inside of us. All we have to do is walk and stand in what his word says, and everything comes to us. Right. But when we start trying to use the scripture, yeah. this scripture, I need a scripture to, to make me feel better today. Then people pull through their Bible and pull up. Listen, the Holy Spirit makes you feel better today. Pray in the Spirit. That's right. <laughs> what does this say? The Bible says when you pray in the Spirit, you edify yourself. So you build you up. Perfect oh, I prayer. need a scripture to, to help me because my mind is bad and I don't know what I should pray for. Great. Pray in the Spirit. It said when the evil, even when we don't know what to pray, pray for, for, the Holy Spirit prays through our infirmities and prays the perfect prayer to God. Amen. We have everything that we need. Amen. He said we have now become one with him and God. And nobody wants to, well, Christians don't want to understand that. And they think that there's something else they're trying to do to get one with God. And God has done everything to bring us one with him and the Father. So you mean to tell me they're just sitting in church and not filled with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I don't understand anybody. <laughs> wow. Anybody that would sit in the church and listen to somebody and say, you don't need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or that the Holy Spirit is babbling of devils. Anybody that sit in churches like that, they need to... <laughs> They need to read their Bible. Right. They need to understand their Bible and understand that was the promise of God, that this yeah. is what was going to happen, and that's what the church is going to be built on. And if you don't believe in that, <laughs> all you got to do is understand John and Jesus. John said, I come baptizing with water. I baptize with water. He ain't say nothing about Jesus going to baptize with water. But nope. you. I come baptizing with water. There's one greater than I who's coming after me, whose shoe lashes I'm not even worthy to unloose. He says, he's preferred before me. He is going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Then Jesus repeated in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, John truly baptized with water, but days from now, you're going to be baptized with fire and the Holy Spirit. 
You got. I don't understand. <laughs> well, then you read Acts 19, and he and all these people got who went through Apollos or something. They all got baptized in John's baptism, and then Paul comes through and goes, "Well, what? What? And? (laughs) So, uh, did he even tell you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit?" They're like, "No," and he's he's like, "I guess I got to do all this stuff too." Hey, you know what's crazy about that? You know know what's crazy about that? (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. That's a good topic. Talking about people feel with that. Think about the people that the people that went through this. Say, hey, can we buy this? People yeah. want to buy the Holy Spirit, and you sitting in church, it is free. All you got to do is ask. Oh man, freely receive, yeah. freely give. Yeah. You know they had that <laughs> in a free my gift. school. It's wow. a free gift. They had that up in my school in the cafeteria. Freely you receive, freely you give, and you know I didn't know. I'm just. Towards- I literally because of how yeah. they applied it, I, I was just they, thinking they took okay. it to a car no mind. Like yeah. oh you know I'm in a prestigious school, like beautiful, you know a lot of wealth here. I guess we give it out. Coming to the church, and I'm just like, yeah. Oh, come on! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, of course, you, you freely receive. You receive well, you the freely receive the, the Spirit. Holy Spirit. You, you give, give it, it out freely. freely. A lot of people will say, "Well, well, Jesus got baptized in the water, so I need to do everything Jesus did." I'm like, dude, Jesus was fulfilling the Levitical <laughs> priesthood, being 30 years old to start his ministry. It had nothing to do with this, and then you but, start explaining like, go ahead. I'm going to answer it because that's just what I'm getting ready to say. Yeah, yeah. That ain't the part they get me. The part they get me is a Jesus baptized. And it's like, and you read it here, nope. it says Jesus baptized, but it says, even though he himself baptized but nobody. nobody. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus didn't baptize anybody. It's his disciples baptized. Yeah. Cause they were, go ahead, because you were saying exactly what it is. They no, were under we're the all, we're all thinking the same thing. It's just, you know, and then it, you keep going to the scripture so that it points to Jesus, and then people just get stuck on one scripture and one little passage and stay there. Yeah. And, it, and it goes back to what you guys have all been saying, like, you won't come to me that you may have life. You do not get life from the baptism of John. You get life from the baptism of Christ. And uh, I don't know why that's so hard to figure out, but at, the, at least the guy I met yesterday, he was real cool. He goes, uh, Holy Spirit filled church. And I said, Holy Spirit filled and Holy Spirit led. And he was like, all right, I'll be there. <laughs> you know, but you just don't hear that very often. Yeah. You know, again, I, not to beat a dead horse. I grew up Catholic. They talk about the spirit all the time, but they never talked about the yeah, spirit of God yeah. being within you, <coughs> let alone the spirit of God leading you. I got a question, Pastor. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, with, with, with this little hearing thing coming up for, for my brother, then, right? So can I go in there and say, can I go in there and use this, this city of refuge? Say, hey, look. <laughs> See, the refuse is jail, so you got to <laughs> keep him in there. He, come out, he, he can get touched up. Would that be me good. using the scripture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, but what see, that's what people do. That's what people do. They use the scripture for their own purpose. And uh, uh, and that's why I'm glad Bruce said it, because I'm going to uh, say could, that in a minute. You kill him and then say, he will even raise the dead. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> no. I mean, you can do anything. Oh, man. And that's why, I mean, you listen to that, and Jesus said you search the scriptures and think you have life. So Jesus is telling you, you can search all the scriptures, then you get people sending you every morning. I'm going to send you a scripture every morning, or I'm going to live by the scripture every morning. They send me a scripture. You something you got? You have no understanding of this Bible. You buy a nice devotional for something. Watch what it says here. Now, we know the thing. Whatever the law says, it says to them under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, that all the world may become guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then you go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 21 says this, there's the law against the promise of God, God forbid. If there had been a law given which could have given life, then very righteous would have been by the law. So there ain't no law given that can give you life. There's no scripture that can give you life. Only Jesus and people still go into the scriptures and try and find life in a scripture instead of finding life in Jesus. You know what's bad? I just thought of something that's really bad. (laughs) Most (laughs) Most churches have Sunday school. And they teach the kids the Ten Commandments. Look what they start them off with. Yeah. They got that poster in the back of the (coughs) Bible study room that we rent out. I mean, how many times did you see the movie where Moses is part in the Red Sea and that's like all you had, the the Ten Commandments, all this stuff, and it's like God says in Jeremiah, I don't even want to be known as that God anymore. I want to be known as the God that scattered my people Israel, not Jews, because that's one tribe of Israel in the whole world. My eyes were on them. And then... I'm going to send fishermen to fish them. And Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I came but to fish back the whole house of Israel. He's using the word Israel. Right. And then 
how is that not talked about, you know? And listen. That's why we all look different, but we all heard that, that uh, good news of the gospel. I'm going to put two scriptures that people don't understand that you have to put together. Go to Luke 10. I talked about this last night, but I didn't talk about the latter part. If you, go, if you put these two set of uh, parables together, then you'll get a full understanding. Luke 10. I got a parable of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> this is what you do in preaching the gospel when you fish men. Jesus answered, well, first they said, uh, certain lawyer, verse 25, stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do that inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the law. No, he, <laughs> no. Didn't. he didn't say that. <laughs> he said, well, he asked him a question. What is written in the law? Then he says, how read it you? How do you read it? How you understand Jesus is trying to get him to say that, let him see that. You ain't understanding this right. Right. Then he says, he answered, said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you have answered rightly this do and you shall live. Now stop. Why didn't he give him the other 10 commandments? Why did he, he give another 16, 16, 613 13. commandments to live? Mm -hmm. He said, if you do these two, you shall live. Yeah. Now, watch what he said. But he willing to justify himself, to, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Jesus answered, said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem, Jericho, he fell among thieves, and which were stripped of his raiment, and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. He's just talking about Adam in the yeah, garden. Yeah. Satan left Adam half dead because the day you eat of this tree, you yeah. shall surely die. Adam died spiritually, but he was still alive as a man. Right. And so he's speaking of Adam being that dead man on the side. Then he said, by chance there came a certain priest. The priest always represent the sacrifice. And he went and saw him and passed by on the other side because the priest wasn't supposed to touch anything dead. Yeah. So that means Adam had ate of that tree and he was dead yeah. according to God. And so the priest's sacrifices couldn't help him. The priest's sacrifice could only cover him for a year and put him in Abraham's bosom after he died. Yeah. But every year that he lives, he got to keep going back and making that sacrifice because right. that sacrifice can't save him. Right. He says, then likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Why? Because the law can't save him either. The Bible says there's no law given that could give righteousness or no law given can give you life. Right. So there was no law you can keep to give you life. So the law, Levite represented the law of Moses. He had to walk by too. Then it says that certain Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was. Jesus left heaven, right. came to where we are at or where Adam, the descendants of Adam is, and he saw him and had compassion on him. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, which means he gave him the gospel, pouring in oil and wine, which is the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit and the covenant, uh -oh. and set him on his own beast, brought him to the inn and took care of him. And on tomorrow when he departed, he took out, that's what Jesus came to the earth, took care Amen. of his disciples, then he departed, and took, care, took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, take care of him, and whatever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. What did he do? Establish the church to take care of them until he comes back, which is now these three things that you think was his neighbor. And he said, him that showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said, go and do down likewise. Jesus came and showed mercy on us. We supposed to go out and show mercy on everybody else. Now he said, take them to the end. What's the end? The church. The church. Now you go to Ephesians chapter four and see the purpose of the church and why he built it. He said, before he ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men or gifts to the church. Read it in 1 Corinthians, it says, first apostles, secondary prophet, third evangelist, then it goes on with all the gifts. But here he said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Ooh. He didn't say he gave them to save you. The gospel is what saves you. Yeah. He gave these gifts. You're supposed mm -hmm. to go sit in church to be perfected it for the work of the ministry. Amen. So people say, well, I don't want to go to church. I don't need to go to church. Well, how are you going to fulfill the will of God if you don't ever get perfected for the work of the ministry? Christianity is not about you going to school, church, feeling good, having coffee and donuts and tea and babysitting room for your church. Car it's to go there to perfect you for the work of the ministry. Oh, we're having a car wash for Jesus, a motorcycle clothes for Jesus. That is not what a church is for. And we go there, all the music, we love to be entertained. You don't go to church to be entertained. You know the purpose of music in the church? Let's see. 
People don't even have the slightest idea of what music is supposed to be for in the church. The music in the church is supposed to be the same thing that Saul wanted David to play the harp for. You in the world, the devil is all around you and got you all messed up. The music of praise to God is supposed to bring all that evil spirit off of you so you can receive the word of God. Amen. This is why people can't go in church and receive the word of God because the, the music that they hear is not glorifying God mm -hmm. to take right, the man. devil off of them. Mm -hmm. The music they're hearing is of the devil and the devil don't, don't go anywhere. He just sits in the church because the spirit of those spirits won't come off of you. So when you go in there and they play the music, it's supposed to prepare your heart to receive the word of God. And say so then it says, it's for perfecting saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building of the body of Christ. Our job is to build the body of Christ. How do you build a body? You go out and preach the gospel and bring souls out of darkness and bring them into light. Then he says, until we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, because what is eternal life? To know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Unto a perfect man, and that man, that does not mean you don't make no mistakes. You look it up in the ancient Hebrew, it means that now to the place where God can use you for his purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to sit in church to become usable by God. Amen. Unto the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. Why? Because he don't want you to henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slaveness of men and cunning and craftiness where they lie and wait to deceive you. Why do you think all these people sit in these churches? Then 10 years later, he took all my money. Oh, he did this to me. And I left. And they blame it on the pastor. Now you blame that on you. You're supposed to sit in a place where God has placed you. He said he placed you in the body as he is pleased. He don't tell you to go place yourself where you want to go. And most people go, well, I'm church hopping. I'm just looking for a church. And I want to find a church that teach what you want to hear. And when it starts telling you what you want to hear and you get fleeced in there, then you want to blame God or you want to blame the church. He said there's a difference between a herald and a man of God. He said a true shepherd cares about the people. Right. A herald will fleece you and run off and leave you. Then he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is even the head, which is Christ, and whom the whole body <coughs> fits, <coughs> excuse me, joined together and compacted by the every joint supplied according to the effectual working and measure in every part, making an increase of the body and to the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You're supposed to change. Your mind is supposed to change from a carnal Gentile mind unto a spiritual Christ mind. And what was Christ's mind? I am about my father's business. This is why he says, who's my brother and sister? Those who do the will of my father. He didn't say those who just go to church or those who just say I believe in Jesus. Those who do the will of his father. You can now say almost 90% of Christians on the planet, what is God's will? And most of them are going to tell you God's will is their will. Well, God put me in this world to be, he wanted me to sing to the world and basically get all this money and do nothing for God. Or he put me in the world, he gave me this gift, this talent to be able to do this and all these things that God gave them the talent for, but it don't benefit God in any way at all. It just benefits yeah. you. And so when you start to hear people say these things, they don't have a clue of what no. God is doing. You got to ask them. When God took them out of the wilderness of Egypt and he says, gave them the gold and silver, what was the gold and silver for? Building. To extend his kingdom. Right. God tells you in the Bible, when he give, go to Deuteronomy 8, when he give you these riches, it's to extend his kingdom. Ain't nothing had nothing to do with just blessing you so you can walk around and say, I'm blessed by God. Oh, God is blessing me. Hallelujah. That has nothing to do with God. Mm -mm. When did God ever say, I'm going to bless you as an individual just to be blessed as an individual? So we're in there. But this is what Christianity has made us become. Is thinking that, well, as long as I'm doing good, my kids are healthy, I'm blessed by God, Satan can bless you with that. Mm -hmm. He's a deceiver. And how does Satan deceive you? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Everybody's walking in these things, and they're saying it's of God. And Jesus said, you can't love God and mammon at the same time. You can't have two masters. And the key is when God says to you to give up the thing you love the most for him, Will you do it? That's the determining factor. If God says, oh, your life, 
You think your life was to be this great entertainer? Okay, that's what you are. Give it up for me. And see where they do it. Abraham gave up what his was most precious possession in his life, which was his son Isaac. God gave up the most precious thing he had, which was his son. God is always going to ask you to, Paul gave up his whole family. People don't understand this. God is going to test you on what you love the most in life. And I'm going to tell you, that ain't a great feeling. <laughs> you know, when God tests you on what you love the most in life, I've been tested twice. With my career and with my daughter. When he told me to give that up, in the same way that I put my effort and time into bodybuilding, he wanted me to put it into his word. I died. Did I cry like a baby for days because I died to myself. I understood that what he wanted from me. And then the verse that the first sermon I was ever supposed to preach in my life, hmm. my daughter's in elementary school and she doesn't come home. Nobody knows where she at. And I got a choice between going looking for my daughter and going preach. And everybody was like, what you going to do? I'm going to look for until uh, the time comes where I can get to where I got to go to preach and I'm going to preach and put it in God's hands. And I'm going to go preach and then we'll, when I get back, we'll continue to look for her. I said, but call me, leave a message on my phone if you find her before I get back home. And I went out and preached the gospel. People are like, I can't believe you did that. You ain't got to believe nothing. I know I had to put right. my hope and my trust in God because of what God said. Then when I get back home, they find my daughter and I asked her the question. I sit her down and I'm like, Corey, why did you do this? And her answer to me was, I was just coming home from school and something told me to go in these people's yard and hide behind the trash cans for no reason. Just told me to go hide there. I said, you did? She said, yeah. And she said, I just sat there till it got dark and then I got up and I came home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right then and there, God showed me the spiritual battle. The spiritual battle was Satan got in her head, told her to hide and just sit there and do nothing to see what I was going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when, when I saw those two things, when God did those two things for me, that's why I tell people all the time, I don't have to question anything anymore. I've mm -hmm. seen God work at his greatest. Mm -hmm. And I've seen God not forsake me or leave me in all the things and times I've had. And people, I, the hardest thing is to get people to understand this. That walk with God is much greater than most people think it is, much greater than most people uh, want to credit it for, because it takes, it takes a hell of a person to die to themselves. I understand what life is. I understand that we got needs. I understand that we got these things. But to be able to see God to the point where you would die to yourself for his purpose, it takes a hell of a person to do that. And I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying you have to find the value in God. Mm -hmm. It ain't got nothing to do with the person is, oh, he's so powerful and great. No, you see a value in God that you can't, that nobody can explain to you. You start to see a, such a value in God that nothing else matters. And you understand that if you devote yourself to God, you save everybody around you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't devote yourself to God, then you leave a gateway for everybody around you to be challenged by the devil. And so... You have to understand that David had to understand that Abraham had to understand that Noah had to understand that, you know, you understand. See, people just look at Noah and you don't understand how many relatives Noah had that had probably died in the flood Ooh. that was yelling out for Noah. And Noah was like, when you read in the book of Joshua, he was like, I can't open the door. God closed it. <clears throat> when Lot walked out and had to leave his son-in-law, you know, he had the other relatives in there. He had to leave them in the, in the land. He had to even leave his wife when she turned around, turned to a pillow of salt. So these things happen. And nobody want to tell you to the extent that God is looking for. He wants preeminence. The true believer is going to give him preeminence no matter what it is. Well, that's the that's one of the things that you got to come to realize, I guess you could say, is Satan would probably be in one of those moments in your head. It's like, it's just one message. Leave your post for just one message. Yeah. You don't see the enemy, do you? What's this one time? You've been standing at this post for however long. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, because you were no, you got, first right. message. But yeah. you were at this post for however long. You haven't seen anything. I'm not going to be there. Leave it for a second. Your daughter is missing. That's a huge... I mean, someone else can cover for you. That's not the... That's not... 
that's not what God called you for. God called you to a position to stand at your post. And yeah. so, again, in the military, you put your life on the line. You are now in the command of the commander, and you don't know what's going on at home, but that's not yeah. your job right now. Yeah, Your job is to be a cog in the, in the war machine. And so we are dead to ourselves. We'll bring it back to this. And you don't think that God's in, not you, you know, anybody yeah. else. You don't think that God's in control of all these things? Like even for that, like God had his hand over your daughter and, and in the instances where Satan tries to convince us, oh, it's one small step away. It doesn't mean anything. What did God tell you to do? Because you either see an instance like that, Satan's going to use that to step right in and plant a seed in someone's mind that it should have never planted there. Who knows? You could lose that person. You would have done now that you, every time, too. Yeah, you hit, you hit it on the head. Think about how many times we do this every day. Drop our kid off to school. You don't know whether they're still at school. And you go to work for eight hours, come back, pick them up. But if God tell you to do something, they don't show up. Oh, I can't go do what God told me to do. You've been doing it every day of your life. <laughs> and don't realize you've been doing it. That's why I keep telling you, everything that God asks us to do, we have already done it in real life. But we just don't understand it because we keep looking at everything so cardinal that we don't look at it spiritually. You know, how many people you assert that kid went, kid went to school that morning and the kid came up missing at school? But the whole time you're at work, you ain't sitting there worried about whether my kid's missing. You just keep working. Mm -hmm. Then you get out of school and find out, well, she didn't come to the second, second hour class. Third hour class, she wasn't there either. That means the kid been missing all day, but you didn't, have, you didn't panic over it until you found out about it. So, but we don't ever think about these things when we, when we follow God and we make excuses for not doing what he wants us to do. And, uh, and that's the tragedy behind it is these things are trials and tribulations and tests that God put us through. And Peter said we're supposed to treat these things like precious gold because they build up our faith in Christ and who he really is. And we get to know him and understand him. And we really truly find out that he does have our back if we keep standing in the faith that he gave us to stand in. And this is why I said if you use a mustard seed of the amount of faith that I gave you, you can tell that mountain to cast itself in the sea and it will. We don't, if, if you ain't seen a mountain cast itself in the sea in 6,000 years, that means <laughs> ain't nobody using more than a mustard seed of the, of the faith that he gave us. So who's really walking around in faith? How you would cast out a demon if you can't even... Trust God for the smallest things. So when you start to understand these things, uh, most of the church, and, and, I, and they, I don't say this in a bad or mean way, I'm trying to wake the church up to the truth of how to operate and stand in God and stand in faith because our whole walk is about faith in Jesus Christ. We walk by faith, not by sight. Christians are walking by sight. <laughs> and they think that scripture means if you see... If you see something and you don't have it, that you're supposed to trust God that you can get it. No. What does Romans say? Watch this. Watch what Romans says. What it says about hope. Romans 8, I think it is. Yeah. Romans 8, 24. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees why does he yet hope for it? For we hope for that what we see not, then we do it with patience, wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helped with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession with it for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So he said the true walk of faith is things that you can't see. And it's not talking about cardinal things. The true walk of faith is that you put your faith, the main thing is that you put your faith in is that one day you're going to die just like Jesus died, and the same spirit that's inside of Jesus is going to raise you up the same way it raised him up. And you had never seen Jesus, you had never seen heaven, but the spirit inside of you got to trust that that same spirit is going to raise you up out of the grave. You got to trust him when that same spirit sends you into the darkness that there are some souls in there that God is going to bring out of that darkness because you're willing to walk into the darkness and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to those souls that need to be brought out of darkness. This is what this is all about. This is not about you being blessed in your cardinal things and the things that give you pleasure in life. It's about doing the will of God. 
you know that that story uh, got me out of a couple bad relationships. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you did because the first thing was, would you do that? Yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> oh, and then it's, you know, yeah. but yeah, something you just said, and then something you just said takes me right here to First Corinthians chapter two, and Paul says in my in verse four, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I mean, people are so worried about traditions uh, and, and keeping things that God didn't ask you to keep than it than worrying about being led of the Spirit and demonstrating the Spirit. If you forgive that man from your heart, that is the power of God. And if you saying, I can see that God is going to take care of that, again, the promise of God is <coughs> every promise is fulfilled through the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit, it's within you then you know that he'll never leave you, never forsake you. Then you can sit there and go, well, all, all things will work out to the good. I just got to trust my Lord and my Savior. But that's a demonstration of the Spirit. That's the power of God. Yeah. Anyone can say, the power of God, uh, because this happened in my life, this happened in my life. I mean, no, the power of God is that you trust something you can't see, and you're doing it by faith. And therefore, your relationship is real. It's not something that's on paper. It's not something that's like, Kumbaya, it's real. And those situations, if you live them out and you pass them, man, they are more precious than silver and gold because you you know that your Lord and Savior lives, that he loves you, and most importantly that, you know, you love him back <clears throat> from your heart. Well, let me say this. Well, somebody said it earlier. I just want to lay these things out here. What a true believer is going to understand. First, I'm going to start with Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. He didn't say having the Spirit. You got to let the Spirit lead you to where God wants you to go. Then he says, we have not received the Spirit of bondage again to fear, but we received the Spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, we will suffer him. We also shall be glorified together. So we're supposed to be children of God. Now, let's go to 1 John. If we say we're children of God, and I love this set of scriptures because he tells you how to verify who you are. He says, I want to start with... Uh, Verse 7 of 1 John 1. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Go to verse 5. This then is the message we heard from him and declare to you. We heard this message from him. That God is in is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So this is a simple message. I don't want to walk in darkness. I want to walk in light. He could tell us how to walk in the light. You go to 1 John 2, verse 9. He that says he's in the light and hate his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light and there's no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walk in darkness, know not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know how I many the people you got in church that hate each other, dislike each other, and don't want to be around each other, but they say, I'm in a light and I love God? Now let's answer that question. Go to 1 John 3. Verse 14, we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we, we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. So he says, to not walk in darkness, all it means is to love one another. Go to verse 4, I mean chapter 4, 1 John. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. For he that loved not his brother whom he's seen, how can he love God who is not seen? This is the commandment we have of him, 
He that loves God loves his brother also. So the whole key to darkness is, I mean, walking in the light is to understand that God got people in darkness and we have to go in darkness and bring these people out in light. You know, you got some people in darkness and people don't care that they're in darkness. You know, I don't care. I don't like him anyway. <laughs> what do you mean you don't like him? How do you know that this is not a child of God somewhere down the road? The same way you gave your life to Christ, you don't know when that person will give their life to Christ. This is the reason he said love your enemies. He doesn't say love your enemies just because they're going to beat you up or they somebody who's going to. He said love your enemies because they may look like a wheat, a tear, but eventually you find out that they are wheat. And I'm going to say this because we laugh about it. Like Carla said to me when they talk about Bruce, he was like, man. <laughs> He said, man, I came in and I saw Bruce in church. And he said, and then I went there and saw him on the podcast. He was like, man, if Bruce is in there, he said, there's hope for me. <laughs> so so there's is, hope for you. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what it's about. You don't know, you know, some people be thinking, that person is unsavable. You know, you're making a judgment call. You have no idea who God is. <laughs> because that person that looked like they're unsavable to you, you don't know where, how God can touch them and when God can touch them. And so you can't have no enemies when it comes down to giving the gospel. Yeah. You got to be willing to give everybody the gospel because that could be God's servant. And you got to look at Paul. Wasn't Paul killing Christians, mm -hmm. putting them in prison? Yeah. But in the time when God pointed time, God called him. He got blinded on the road to Damascus and he turned out to be a vessel for God. And Ananias could even understand that when he saw, I know about this guy. He's killing Christians. But God said, leave him alone. He's the chosen one of mine. We can't determine who's God until that call comes, and then we watch God change these people, man. And, it, and it's amazing. Number one, it's amazing watching God change you. Then watch God change somebody else is an amazing thing also. So God is really amazing when you really understand and see who he is and what he's trying to do. But, but most of the church is so caught up in these self-righteous acts instead of understanding that God is looking for people, and it's God is one who's going to give them a new heart. God is going to be one who's going to give them a new mind and a new spirit that changes them and calls them to walk in his ways. Thank you for another episode of The Time Is Now, where the word of God is truth and power. My name is Pastor Charles White of the Ecclesia of Jesus Christ, 7475 Fallbrook Avenue, West Hills, California. And you can visit us at our website, ecclesiaofjesuschrist.net. Enjoy your day.